Hello and welcome to another YouTube presentation by the London Transport Museum Friends. This time our spotlight is on London railway stations, London's great railway stations to be precise. Uh, as our speaker will no doubt explain, that is the title of a recently published book authored by Oliver Green himself with photography by Benjamin Graham. Oliver will be known to many of you as a transport historian and transport author and as a past head curator at London Transport Museum. Benjamin won the prestigious Landscape Photographer of the Year Award in 2017. I saw this presentation when it was given live in front of a friend's audience at the museum before Christmas. We are now able to share it on our wider YouTube channel uh, for our YouTube friends in this recording. Having seen it, I know you're in for a treat. So Oliver, over to you. Hello. This presentation is about London's great railway stations, and it's really an introduction to a book that I've recently published um, in partnership with Ben Graham, who's the photographer on this. And we compiled the whole book uh, and presentation during COVID lockdown. So it's recently, it's really been compiled and the photography in particular has been taken all during the last two years, basically during the period when we've been unable to use the railway um, and most other people have too. But actually it was an ideal period to photograph the stations because it allowed you to photograph them uh, in a way which is just not possible when there are crowds of commuters going through. So it's been an interesting exercise uh, and we've ended up with an excellent book. And we particularly, both of us, like to thank um, Sir Peter Hendy, Chairman of Network Rail, who has very kindly facilitated much of our work, um, both photography and he's kindly written an introduction to the book. What we've done in the book, and you're only going to see a selection here, is we've worked our way round the mainline stations of London, and we've done it clockwise effectively and you can see from the uh, the map uh, that has now been put up that where the stations are and we're working around it in a clockwise way from Paddington in the northwest uh, right round to Victoria in the southwest. This is not uh, the order that the stations were built so it's not chronological but it's it's the most logical way to present the stations I think and it's the way we've done it in the book. We've also been inspired, I think it's fair to say, uh, and this is the next image, um, by Sir John Betjeman, who is well known to have been really the, the first potential saviour of the great Victorian London railway stations, um, who is particularly keen on um, St Pancras and Paddington. This is the view of the statue of Sir John at St Pancras International, with its <coughs> improved and cleaned roof, which he never saw, but would have loved to have seen. And the statue which went up to him in 2007 is particularly appropriate, I think, in that way. So he's our inspiration. Um, Sir Peter is our facilitator, if you like, and we're now going to take you around the stations. Uh, unfortunately, Benjamin has not been able to join us today. He did for the original presentation, but has been unable to for this. Um, so I'm thanking him in absentia. Now, Paddington, where we're starting, is not the first of the London railway stations, but it is the best preserved of the Victorian stations. And I should say right away that um, London is exceptional in having more large terminal mainline railway stations than any other city in the world. It was also one of the first to have them and one of the last to complete them. So what we've covered in the book is the story from the very first uh, London Bridge in the 1830s, which was opened just months before Victoria came to the throne. And the last of the stations uh, was built uh, and completed just before she died. So they're all essentially in origin Victorian stations. Uh, and that came to a total of 15, of which only two have been lost completely. So back to Paddington. Um, if we now move on to the central view of Paddington, 
This is also the cover view of our book, and it's taken from Platform 1 at Paddington. And I should mention this on Ben's behalf as the photographer, because this was actually the first photograph that we took when we were scouting around the stations, and it shows the view across the uh, the aisles of Paddington Station um, just before it gets dark, but it shows perfectly the symmetry of Brunel's design of the station, which was opened in 1854, and it was a particularly happy coincidence that the very first photograph Ben took was taken with a train precisely located in the right position. Uh, he wasn't even using his best camera to do this and wasn't using a tripod, but it formed the perfect photograph, which we decided then and there had to go on the cover. Um, so this is it, and this is what you'll see on the cover of the book. If we move down now to the view on Platform 1, looking down from the location where that last photograph was taken, this is the view looking back towards the end of the platforms, and I think is one of the, the best views to come across if you arrive in London by train. Uh, I commuted into Paddington for many years and uh, always hoped that I'd get off the train on Platform 1 next to what I also think is one of the best war memorials in London, which is this um, wonderful statue on the right here, which is just over life size, but I think is probably one of the most moving war memorials in London and shows uh, a Tommy on the Western Front clearly reading a letter from home. Very unusual for a war memorial because uh, he's not armed. He is ready for combat in every other way. Um, but it's, it's a, a very peaceful war memorial, also in a very prominent position. And I think quite unlike traditional war memorials, which are usually rather warlike in their, uh, in their view. And further down the platform, you can see there the the great clock on platform one, um, which is still there, still working um, since it was first installed. And the platform really does give you a, a sense of arrival if you're coming into London and a great sense of departure. This is also the uh, main platform that in uh, in the late evening is the departure point for the uh, sleeper trains that go, or the single sleeper train that goes down to Penzance um, most nights of the week. And the next one is a general view of Paddington looking down the platforms with two of the new Hitachi um, bimode trains at the platforms also forming an almost symmetric design, which pleased Benjamin and his photography. Those trains have now replaced the, all the uh, traditional, well, I say traditional, but they go back many years to the 1970s, the high-speed trains, which are, now don't serve Paddington, but provide a, a very sleek and streamlined service at the station now. And the station has also been cleaned and relit in recent years, so it probably now looks better than it ever has done uh, since it was built in the 1850s. And if we move on to the next shot, there's a detail of um, the side of Platform 1 with the offices behind, and that shows the contribution of Wyatt, who was the architect that Brunel uh, persuaded to collaborate with him on the station. Brunel basically designed the train sheds, which are still virtually unaltered from their original style, and he got Wyatt to design the, the decorative features, both of the metalwork uh, and of the, the buildings on the side. Wyatt was actually one of the uh, secretaries to the Great Exhibition in the 1850s, and he provided an appropriate contribution, really, because the station was designed just after the Crystal Palace, which, of course, was the great architectural triumph of London at the time. And um, I think his contribution, in some ways, is as important as Brunel's. It's not simply decorative, but it is adding a decorative element to um, 
Brunel's brilliant piece of engineering, which are the main train sheds. And this style of, of uh, train shed, in many ways, set the tone for uh, large railway stations, both in London and all over the country. So if we move on to the next slide. There's the end view of Paddington taken from the road bridge, the Bishop's Road Bridge over the station, which very nicely combines what's gone on around Paddington since it was built and the continuation of its architectural style. The um, roof building there, you see, is the fourth span, as it's called, which was added to Brunel's three arch span uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, when by which time the station really was needing enlargement. And what they cleverly did was virtually replicate what Brunel had done, but also added uh, elements of Wyatt's decoration. So the, that filigree decoration on the um, on the station end, which you see on the right, is replicated in the latest addition to Paddington on the far left, on that glass wall there, which is the recently completed um, reconstruction of the Hammersmith and City Underground Line station to one side of Paddington. Apart from being a main line station, Paddington also had, right adjacent to the original station, part of the original London Underground, uh, which opened in 1863. And the two have recently been remarried, if you like, through this new decorative scheme for a new booking hall of the uh, underground there, which I think perfectly fits with the Victorian style of the old station, but is equally um, superbly modern. And beyond the station there, you can see St Mary's Hospital next door, which is adjacent to the canal and the new office development that's gone on all round the canal, which I should say was the original reason that um, Paddington was built here. It was not just for passengers, but for goods to be offloaded uh, on the adjacent goods yard um, onto the canal. And that link with the canal is not a practical one now, of course, uh, because nobody gets off and goes onto the canal, but uh, it's provided a, a context for Paddington and the development of that area, which is now, of course, mainly a business area with offices, but um, has always been linked uh, to the railway. And it's almost essentially about passengers today. Well, if we may now move down the road to Marylebone, which is a short walk away from Paddington, but as I said earlier, is actually the last station to be uh, mainline station to be built in London, and it's a long, um, so it's a long time distance really from the origins of Paddington, and there you see the view of of the station um, from outside. Uh, it was completed in the eighteen nineties, by which time most people felt that there wasn't actually a need for another railway station in London, but Sir Edward Watkin, chairman of the uh, Great Central Railway, was determined to build the final main line to London. The trouble was that he ran out of money on it, and um, the station is actually, in most people's eyes, really rather modest and uh, not quite up to the scale that a main line terminus in London should be. It's um, not even designed by an architect, actually. It was designed by the company's engineer. But it forms uh, a rather cosy little station, which uh, Betjeman felt was much like a Midlands public library. I'm not sure whether that's uh, an insult or not, but he clearly liked the station. And it's always felt like a rather comfortable little station. Um, you can see um, here the main facade of the station. Just out of picture to the right of the tree on the right-hand side is uh, the Great Central Hotel, which was built uh, at the same time as the station. But by this time, the railway company had more or less run out of money, uh, and Watkin was actually quite ill and only just survived the opening of the station. But the 
hotel next to it, the Great Central Hotel, was actually separately financed from the railway company. And neither the station nor the hotel ever really achieved their potential. They were always sort of backwater stations, really, until really quite recently. Um, not many trains called at uh, Marylebone to begin with. The line was duplicated um, to both to Nottingham and to Manchester um, by other railways and never achieved that much uh, in the way of, uh, of transport. Um, but it survived, surprisingly enough, although there were proposals for closure. The hotel next door was uh, eventually closed and turned into offices. And I remember it being still offices uh, for British Rail in the 1970s. It was then uh, actually sold by British Rail and it's re-emerged as a hotel. Uh, it's one of the grandest central London hotels uh, and, and really rather fine. The station had had declining services for years um, and the main line uh, north of Aylesbury was actually cut uh, in the um, 1960s. But again, there's been a potential revival there. It's actually in recent years, uh, the commuter traffic of local trains to Marylebone has revived. Um, the station's been modernised, um, but still looks pretty good. It may not be grand, but it's it's become a rather cosy little station, which is actually well used now, and now provides some of the reinstated or new services um, that were once provided 100 years ago, um, including a new services to Oxford, uh, which are ironically in competition uh, as successful probably as the Great Western services to Oxford from Paddington. There's the interior of the station, which has been considerably brightened up since it was all refurbished and the platforms rearranged in the uh, in the 1990s, in the middle of the station, there used to be a, a cab road which went right the way through, but was hardly ever used. It used to be said that the porters stood around at uh, Paddington and at uh, Marylebone and outnumbered the uh, passengers. And that was said even in the 1920s. Um, of course, now the porters have all gone anyway, but the number of trains using Marylebone has actually uh, developed considerably. And there are now through trains, for example, to Birmingham, which there never were in the station's so-called heyday. The only uh, problem, if you like, with Maribel is it, it is actually entirely, um, it's the only station in London which uh, is, has not been electrified. So all the trains at the moment are still diesel hauled rather than uh, electric, but that will no doubt be changed in the years to come. Moving across from um, Marylebone to Euston, this is moving along the, the Marylebone Road. Euston, as it is now, bears really no resemblance to its original condition. Um, Euston was the second uh, station to be built in London originally, opened in 1837, just after Queen Victoria came to the throne. And in some ways, it was gr many, uh, much larger and much grander than uh, the first London station, London Bridge, which we'll come to shortly. Euston was the first full-scale main line because unlike the London Bridge line, which only went as far as Greenwich originally, um, Euston was the terminus for the London and Birmingham Railway, which was a true intercity line um, from Birmingham. But it was never very well planned, Euston, and there have been many attempts to uh, enlarge it and reconstruct it which eventually took place in the 1960s. Uh, and it became, I suppose, the first of the London railway stations about which there was a, a major conservation issue and complaints about the plans by British Rail at that time to re reconfigure the station. 
In this presentation, I'm simply showing the station as it is now. Uh, and if you look at our book, you will see the comparison with the station as it was. But most people, I think, were extremely disappointed with what was done at Euston. It did need uh, refurbishment in the 1960s, but of course this was the time when the general feeling, uh, which had been around since uh, after the war, that station redesign should, uh, like with other buildings, should completely sweep away uh, Victorian architecture and um, should approach everything with a new form. And what happened at Euston was that the new station was designed essentially like an airport, um, except the major problem, unlike an airport, it, um, it had large spaces, but no seats. And I think today, the, the new Great Hall, uh, which was built in 1968 and had involved the entire demolition of what existed there before, the famous Euston Arch and the, great, the original Great Hall, all of that was unnecessarily swept, swept away. Uh, there was no attempt to combine old and new, such as there is now. And Euston has become a sort of temple of modernity, but rather second-rate modernity. The best feature of it, I have to say, is that amazing floor, which looks like a, a ballroom from the 1960s, really, a great green marble floor, which is huge in the main terminal section, but really quite unnecessarily huge because it's not a very usable place. There are no seats there, uh, at least there are very few, and it's a sort of cold and uncomfortable station to use. Um, but this is what you have now in place of the rather grand uh, Victorian hall that was there, actually pre-Victorian, uh, its original design, and the, the Great Arch, the Euston Arch, again, had no real function other than saying grandly from the railway company, here we are in London and we're the future. But um, by the 1960s, they were clearly considered the past and railway stations had to be considered, as I say, like airports. So that new hall is there, but that too is now likely to go with the um, alterations to Euston uh, created by uh, the HS2 plans, and part of uh, Euston has already been demolished. This is the view outside the station, as it is now. Uh, there's the rather bland 1960s Great Hall, which from the outside just looks like a grim box. Behind it there, you can see um, one of the office towers which sprang up outside the new Euston in the 1970s, um, designed by Richard Seifert, I think. And oddly enough, although Benjamin didn't realise this when he photographed it, that was about to go. Um, within weeks of this photograph being taken, uh, that office block and some of the other buildings surrounding the 1960s Euston were demolished. And in place of that uh, building, there is going to be the extension of the existing Euston uh, with a new, completely new station for HS2. Quite what's going to happen to the existing Great Hall, we don't know yet, but there are plans to completely redevelop that or at least remodel it. So I think within a few years, uh, we will see another development, Euston 3, if you like, which will be completely different from both Euston 1 and Euston 2. Uh, although there is the possibility that there could be reconstruction of the Euston Arch, we just don't know yet. And just to give you a view of the interior of Euston, which most people will know, one of the most disappointing things about Euston was that even when you got on the platforms, it retained its grim concrete look and still does. So when you go down the platforms, although you may have a, um, a whizzy new, fairly new train in the um, new Avanti trains on the West Coast, these are tilting trains and are very smart and streamlined, but the context they're in at Euston is still 
essentially grim and you want to get off those platforms as soon as you can. There is very little daylight on the platforms um, or decoration of any kind. So it's not an encouraging scene. But Euston is an important station and it will still need to be um, redeveloped for the future. My next photograph is really a, a sort of um, quiz shot almost. This is uh, a detail of one of the uh, remaining, perhaps the only bit of decoration of 1960s Euston, which is rather superb in a strangely modernist way. This is actually um, part of the ceiling ventilation system in the Great Hall where, where there used to be uh, an inquiry office. It's all now been opened up, but this little bit of the ceiling has remained and you can see it if you go in to buy a ticket, if you haven't bought one in advance, on Avanti West Coast. Um, there's the ceiling beyond the ticket machines, which um, looks like a, a sort of modern art egg box of the 1960s. It's really rather impressive. And I do hope that if they do decide to completely demolish the uh, existing station, that somehow that uh, rather wonderful ceiling feature is retained, even though it's not supposed to be an artwork. It really should be preserved. Well, that's Euston of the future. We now move further along the Euston Road to St Pancras, which is an utter contrast to Euston um, and dates from the late 19th century, the apogee of Gothic architecture. And that's a feature, as you'll notice as we go through, that although there are a lot of railway termini in London, none of them are exactly the same. And the grandest of them all, uh, and some might say the most impractical of them all, is St Pancras. So here's St Pancras as it looks now, and as um, Benjamin was able to photograph it um, without cars, or virtually without cars, which is quite unusual, uh, and again was one of the benefits of London's emptiness uh, during the pandemic. Here's the view um, from the Euston Road of what is not actually the station, but is the station hotel. Um, St Pancras was built in by an engineer and an architect, and it was really built in two halves, but they had to perfectly merge together. What you can see in that view is the station, which is the bit on the far right with its uh, wonderful arch, which we'll see in a minute, and the hotel, which was actually built after the station in front of it. Just a bit of context about St Pancras. St Pancras is interesting because when the, the railways came to North London and these stations uh, were, were built along what's now the Marylebone and Euston Roads, the stations had all had to cross the um, canal just outside uh, and to, to get into um, that far into central London, they had to... Um, create quite a lot of mayhem, both demolishing uh, lots of property and also running through um, some graveyards, which themselves had only been built there uh, because they were just outside the edge of central London in those days. And what you see here uh, on the left-hand side is the view in St Pancras Old Churchyard, which uh, the line to St Pancras had to cut through um, to get to as far as it was allowed, which was onto the Euston Road. Those um, gravestones there, you can see around that tree, are now known as that little assemblage there is known as the Hardy Tree. And uh, that was because when these, uh, when the railway was cutting through there and the navvies were at work on building the line through the graveyard, they um, rather unceremoniously dug up a lot of old graves. They were supposed to be reburying them uh, properly, but they threw them around and there apparently were uh, stories of skeletons and, uh, and whatever around in the graveyard. There were complaints from the Bishop of London and um, an architect was set 
to make sure that it was done properly, this uh, reconstruction, and that the, uh, the graves were properly tended to and the coffins reburied. The person who was overseeing this uh, was um, the architect's uh, main assistant at the time, who was Thomas Hardy. This was uh, Hardy trained as an architect before he became a, uh, a poet and writer. And he was set to work, actually had to sit in the, in the graveyard at night uh, when the uh, navvies were working on the graves and make sure that they were doing it all properly. And he arranged for the, uh, the existing gravestones to be put uh, neatly round a tree in the graveyard. Um, and there it is to this day. And some of the um, bushes around now grow through those graves. But behind it there, you can see the wall, which was built uh, originally uh, by the Midland Railway when they cut through, and their trains uh, ran the other side of it. There's had to be more reconstruction more recently with the uh, arrival of HS1 high-speed line into St Pancras, and there you can see that the, uh, the wall has actually been uh, rebuilt and heightened. The other bit beyond there is the um, the reconstructed gasworks, which again were just outside St Pancras until very recently, but have now had to um, be moved because they were preserved um, listed items. And they've actually gone round some of the new apartment blocks, uh, just the other side of the wall there and the other side of the line. So... The railway has continued to have an effect on the St Pancras and King's Cross area even many years after its original construction and it's been further rebuilt lately. And the latest part of that has been to extend St Pancras station itself, which you see on the right-hand side. That's the entirely modern part of St Pancras International, uh, which has been rebuilt from the original station uh, and was opened in 2007, which provides a new terminus for uh, the continental trains, the Eurostar trains, uh, coming across from Paris and elsewhere since the opening of the um, Channel Tunnel. But it's a utter contrast in styles, but still very appropriate, I think, to a modern railway. Um, there's the Undercroft um, looking out of the station there. That's been designed by Norman Foster, again, um, bringing major architects into the construction uh, or reconstruction of a station which originally had been down to one of the great Victorian architects, um, Sir Giles Gilbert Scott. And at the same time uh, as the reconstruction of the station, the main parts of it have been preserved. This is part of the original Gothic design of the entrance by um, Gilbert Scott, which has been beautifully uh, reconstructed at great expense. For many years, St Pancras had fallen into disrepair, it had fewer and fewer trains using it, and there were attempts um, which could well have been successful to just close and demolish the whole station. Fortunately, it, it soldiered on. Um, Betjeman always said, said this as early as the 1940s that he thought um, St Pancras was too beautiful and ethereal for British railways to do anything with it, and he was certain that they were going to demolish it. Um, he didn't actually live to see its uh, refurbishment for HS1, but that's why the, uh, the statue of him uh, and his campaigning to try and save it, I think, is most appropriate there. But there you can see the, what was originally at the taxi entrance uh, to St Pancras. As it's now been restored, it's now just a foot entrance to the main station. But uh, all that beautiful brickwork, uh, which is very expensive to design, has been preserved. And most glorious of all is that um, train shed designed by Barlow, who was the uh, engineer of the Midland Railway, who built the line. There it is as it is now, cleaned and relit, 
and used by Eurostar trains coming from the continent. The link with Europe, of course, was thought about in the 19th century, and it was even people did even start to try and dig a channel tunnel then. Uh, and that original project involved Sir Edward Watkin, who originally got his station to uh, Marylebone. But there it is, um, he, he didn't uh, pursue his uh, desire to get trains under the channel in the 19th century. He gave up on that. But um, what seemed like wacky ideas at that time have eventually been achieved. And the railway is now, goes direct through to Paris and beyond. And the station, again, like Paddington, probably looks better now, cleaned up, uh, than it did when it was finally constructed in the 1860s. This was the first bit of St Pancras to be um, completed in 1868, by which time the hotel in front uh, was underway, but wasn't actually completed until the 1870s. Uh, at that time, it was the most expensive hotel building in London. But interesting what the uh, restoration of St Pancras has revealed is the way the whole building works because in constructing the original station, the, uh, the rebuilt station uh, to serve Eurostar, um, the architects have actually opened up um, part of the uh, floor below, which is actually at ground level, which was originally designed um, for use by trains bringing beer uh, down from the Midlands. And... They've cut through to create a, a new walkway at ground level. And there you can see that track level is uh, upper right above. Um, and below that is the new section of St Pancras, which actually serves as the entrance to, to the Eurostar station. On the left there, you can see the original booking office, which is on the upper level. And that's now part of the hotel which has been separately restored. It's a complicated story, which I can't go into now, but um, the original magnificence, both of the hotel building designed by Scott and the um, main structure of the station designed by Barlow are both really laid bare in a most dramatic way. So you've got a combination of old and new, which just works dramatically. There's the interior of the station, originally called the Midland Hotel, now um, reconstructed separately from the station and called the uh, St Pancras Renaissance Hotel, rather appropriately. Um, but large parts of the magnificent Victorian structure have been completely restored, uh, the central part of which is that um, main staircase, which you see on the left there, uh, which was the first bit to be restored. And people wondered whether the whole thing ever would be finished, but eventually it was. Rather like the Great Central Hotel at uh, Maribyrn, this had become offices for British Railways in the 1950s, actually in the 1930s, and, and right through the intention was eventually to get rid of it. But it became a listed building, and um, the station uh, has been restored to its former glory, although in two halves, if you like, because the, the hotel is quite separate from the station. But it, of course, can form uh, an embarkation point if you're going to Paris. And it's definitely the best way to get from London to Paris and the quickest way. There's actually part of the original, on the right-hand side, part of the, uh, what was originally the... Uh, cab entrance to the booking hall uh, and that area is now the reception of the hotel but you can see there the amazing gothic design of the uh, water down pipes there uh, which are absolutely beautifully constructed it it definitely still is the, uh, the most magnificent hotel in london i think and and still at least partly linked to the railway 
before we move across to the next station, which is King's Cross, um, just a, a quick look over from the extended part of um, St Pancras Station across to King's Cross. This is the view um, from the link to the uh, enlarged underground station, which now serves both St Pancras and King's Cross. On the left there, you can see the German gymnasium just outside St Pancras, which interestingly was the first uh, or one of the first buildings in London to be hit and damaged by German bombs in the First World War, rather ironically, it was the German gymnasium. It's now been very nicely restored and is a um, mainly forms restaurants and cafe areas. In the centre, there is the extension of King's Cross, and on the right hand, far right hand side is the uh, the hotel that was built outside King's Cross Station, uh, next door to St Pancras. Well, if we now move on to King's Cross, King's Cross was built um, in the 1850s, quite a bit earlier than St Pancras next door, but the Midland Railway, when it came to London in the 1860s, one of their main um, ideas was to completely overshadow King's Cross next door. King's Cross was built by the Great Northern Railway, and when the Midland Railway um, wanted to get to London, it had to send its trains over at considerable cost. Uh, they had to rent the lines, if you like, of the Great Northern to get their trains to London and eventually decided that they had to build their own line. But this was some years after King's Cross had opened and it took them some while to arrange that. Also cost them a lot of money. But um, the station itself does certainly overshadow King's Cross quite considerably. Here is King's Cross as it looks now. King's Cross again has been magnificently restored in recent years. Um, it's now been virtually completed, so the station again is looking better than it ever has done since the middle of the 19th century. Uh, this is a shot that Ben took in the middle of the night. I think the, uh, the station clock there is, says about 20 past four or something in the middle of the night. And on the left-hand side there, you can see the new extension which has been created to King's Cross, which was always really a bit crowded as a station, despite being allegedly the gateway to the north with mainline trains going straight up the east coast to Edinburgh. Um, but the station itself was somehow quite never quite uh, what it should be. Uh, and you may remember, if you think back to the... Uh, only just a few years ago, there was a, an extension at the front of King's Cross uh, on the right-hand side of that view, which had a, a new booking hall uh, in rather bland 70s style. But even if you bought your tickets there, you still then had to queue up in great sna sneaking groups inside the um, main part of the station um, to get the train. What's happened now is it's been... Um, extended to the left-hand side uh, and there's a new link to the Great Northern Hotel which has also been preserved and that was originally going to be demolished. The King's Cross has been magnificently cleaned up both literally physically as an area and in terms of its entire feel this area outside the station was for many years pretty grim um, but King's Cross now is um, really dramatic and this the square outside the station which often has a street food market during the day or at least it did before lockdown uh, hopefully we'll get that again um, and the building itself has been cleaned it's mainly consists of two long arched structures which are the main parts of the station originally it was just departures one side arrivals the other uh, now it's a complete mix of the two There's the interior of one of the arched areas. Um, 
The reconstruction has been very carefully done so that the best aspects of the original station have been preserved, um, including that magnificent clock there, which originally was located on a footbridge, which had to be taken down, but other ways of making the station more accessible have been installed. There's a new lift there, you can see. And um, the station has been considerably cleaned up, as they all have, since the grime of steam days. But most dramatic of all is the extension to one side, to the western side of King's Cross, where in what was a, a yard, really, for the um, parcel services and access to suburban services, has now had built above it this magnificent new roof, um, which appears to come out of the ground like a fountain. Because King's Cross is a listed building, they had to design this such that it, it didn't actually touch the or be supported by the main station beyond. So what you have there in that view is the old 1850s station cleaned up and restored behind with this fantastic new fountain-like roof uh, designed in front of it. Uh, and if you go to King's Cross when it's just beginning to get dark, the lighting of this begins to change and it goes through a different cycle uh, each time. Really quite superb. And I think one of the, the best bits of modern railway architecture in London. And if you turn round from that spot there, you would see the other side, which has got this wonderfully curling, uh, there's a balcony area there, which has got shops and coffee bars on it. And so you can sit there, sip a coffee. Uh, you've got your ticket. You haven't got a queue up. Uh, you can wait till your train's ready and you'll be called. Um, and you can see the uh, the boards, which are just reflected there, of the uh, departures right ahead of you, but in some comfort. So using King's Cross is quite a pleasure today, whereas it used to be pretty stressful. I should say this is designed by the architect John McCaslin, the uh, the new building. Uh, and there's part of it on the left. And there's the interior of the train sheds with new... Uh, these are Hitachi trains, which um, are very similar to the new trains on the um, on the Great Western at Paddington. They're both uh, both designs are are bimode trains, which means they're part electric and part they also have diesel generators um, in them as well. But the stations, the trains have a uh, a distinct similarity in some ways to the the famous streamliners of the LNER, which uh, appeared at King's Cross in the 1930s. And I think they seem somehow the most appropriate modern style to be adopted at this magnificent Victorian station. Now on into the city, which resisted getting railways for a long time, although one or two crept in in the early 19th century. But um, the biggest that eventually uh, was built in the city itself, the city of London, was Liverpool Street. And Liverpool Street um, was an extension of the Great Eastern Railway from uh, its original terminus at Bishopsgate, which is just outside the city boundary, but was a, a, a very poor and um, slum-ridden area of East London. And the, the company were anxious to get into the city itself uh, so that their commuters didn't have to uh, walk through these rather unsavoury areas of East London. They eventually achieved that in the 1870s, um, some 20 years after arriving in, at the edge of London, and created a very large station at, at Liverpool Street. It cost them a lot of money to do it because they had to demolish quite a lot and they had to provide some new accommodation, at least for the people who lost their homes. Um, and over the years, uh, over the next century, really, um, Liverpool Street became increasingly busy. Uh, it was at one time in the early 1900s the busiest of the London termini. And 
by the uh, 1980s, um, it was decided that Liverpool Street had to be rebuilt. But after the um, all the fuss that had happened with the demolition of Euston in the 1960s, which was the first um, big battle, I suppose, conservation battle, which was lost by the, those keen on conservation, um, by the time Liverpool Street was being considered in the 70s, um, there was a determination that Liverpool Street shouldn't simply be going underground, which was the original plan. They were going to demolish both uh, Liverpool Street and Broad Street next door and put the combined stations underground uh, with no uh, visible buildings on top at all. Both the train sheds would have been demolished um, and it would have been, I think, a very bland new development, probably a bit like Birmingham New Street. But that was fought. There was a public inquiry and that didn't happen. The public inquiry led to the preservation of large parts of Liverpool Street. Um, Broad Street was sacrificed, that was demolished, uh, and parts of Liverpool Street were built over. But um, what emerged was a new station at Liverpool Street which preserved parts of the old station, the Victorian station, uh, and created a, um, a rather unusual atmosphere at Liverpool Street, which would um, otherwise have been lost. Um, and what you have now, and you can see there on the left-hand side, uh, is a view of um, one of the entrances to Liverpool Street with a what looks now like a Victorian tower. There are two of them um, at the front, which are actually based on the design of the Great Eastern Hotel, just around the corner, which had also been threatened with demolition. So what you now have is a, uh, a station which has preserved its original roof designs, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, but also included um, what I suppose some people would say are fake reconstructions, but actually fit rather well with the modernity of the station. Um, and you've got a, an interesting comparison, really, of old and new, which just seems to work in a way that uh, 1960s Euston did not at all. So there you have uh, new parts of the station on the left, based on uh, parts of the old Great Eastern Hotel. And beyond it there is the Broadgate Centre, uh, which is entirely modern. Uh, and that's on the site of the old Broad Street station, uh, which was demolished when the uh, old North London line into um, Broad Street was closed in the 1980s. The picture on the right shows the view between the two stations as they are now, or the sites of the two stations. On the right-hand side there, uh, with a, a new route master outside, is Liverpool Street. Um, and on the left of that right-hand picture is the Broadgate complex. Uh, so between them, there is now a bus station uh, so that people can walk from the high level uh, of Liverpool Street directly out and catch a bus there, which is really, I think, quite a nice comparison of old and new. This is all the old, the original building of Liverpool Street on the right, um, but it's been completely cleaned up and it no longer looks inside as it, as it once did. If we go to the next view, um, there's the exterior of Liverpool Street, and there you can see the two towers, which are both built in the 1980s, but look as though now, anyway, uh, so they could have been there for about 150 years. Right opposite is the entrance to the underground station, uh, and the underground was the original reason why Liverpool Street was built, uh, with the tracks coming in at a lower level, because originally there was a connection with the Metropolitan uh, railway um, across the street. There in the middle behind the underground sign you can see the towers of the old Great Eastern Hotel which is now closed. I'm not quite sure what it's being redeveloped as but um, the building has been preserved um, and those two modern towers on the left and there are two more of them on Broadgate itself just over the back 
Um, look as though they've been there since Victorian times, but are actually 1980s station. And on the left-hand side there is is that um, the side of the station which uh, is parallel to Broadgate. If we now look inside, that is a view across the concourse with those rather cathedral-like windows at one end. And you can see that, that the station actually is on two levels. So right round the station, there is a an upper level, which used to be uh, really rather sinister at night. It was, uh, and the, the station walls, of course, were all black originally, have all been cleaned up. Um, Betjeman used to call it the dark cathedral, and I can see why. But it, it looks like a, a very much a nicely cleaned cathedral these days. And if we look at the long view there in black and white, um, the station concourse, which has been opened up uh, considerably uh, and no longer has walkways across it in the same way, but it does have a higher level. And you can also see the, the various features which were preserved at Liverpool Street, like the magnificent war memorial there in the centre of the picture, which were... Uh, kept and uh, in some cases moved. I mean, that war memorial was actually originally in the booking office on the ground floor. It's been moved to that upper level. And there are lots of architectural features all over, including in some cases replicas of the ceiling columns, which were actually reconstructed in Victorian style when the station was rebuilt. Uh, and you really are hard put now to tell the difference between the replica bits of Liverpool Street and the original bits, particularly as it's all been uh, repainted uh, and it all used to be pretty grim and grimy and for over a hundred years had not seen a lick of paint at all. There's a close-up of the uh, War Memorial and some of the columns. Those two actually you can see the difference in colour between those two. I think those are probably some that uh, one of those may be a replica uh, column with all its acanthus leaves replaced. Um, the, the new and old were in the 1980s um, uh, only identifiable by the fact that the um, one were, were now painted in a, uh, a sort of cream colour and one in white but I think the two colours have more or less merged together in the last 30 years. But you can see there, above the War Memorial, uh, another inscription of the Great Eastern Railway, which had been moved from an office building just outside the station. And um, the, the station memorial itself actually had to um, be uh, replaced as well, or re removed rather. Now, another much smaller um, station in the city, Fenchurch Street, which is a fairly short walk from Liverpool Street, but is actually probably the least known of the London stations. Uh, it's not actually even on Fenchurch Street, um, but it's a, a very modest little station which still only has uh, four tracks into it. And... There's the facade, um, built in the 1850s, but actually that facade, which has been preserved, is the only uh, remaining part of, of Fenchurch Street. If you go into the uh, station, you go upstairs to the um, platforms, but all of that area of the station has been rebuilt and uh, a new uh, office block has been built on top of the station um, since the 1980s. If we move on to the next view, there you can see on the right there that on what used to be simply a, a curved terminal roof has been taken out and set back so that it doesn't spoil the view. There is a completely new office block right on top of it. Office space in the City of London has become it still is uh, at a premium and so wherever possible developers have tried to encroach on railway stations and build right around them and in some cases as here on top of them 
but um, the remaining station, as you can see there, does run um, physically on a spring day there, where they planted trees in the forecourt. It really is quite an attractive little station, but it's only used by people travelling to South Essex. Uh, the line doesn't go very far, it goes to South End, uh, at the end and it goes to Tilbury, but it's only commuters really who use that uh, particular line, successful though it is. Well, across the river now to London Bridge, the original London railway terminus, um, which was opened in 1836. No trace of that original station now, but you can see the station. Um, it all uh, It's all located at a high level as it originally was. It originally came in from Greenwich on a viaduct uh, to this site just to the south of London Bridge. They weren't going to be allowed to get any closer to the city, which was their ultimate destination. So anybody coming into uh, London Bridge always had to cross the river uh, to get to their city location. And the station itself gradually spread out on a high level across quite a large site, as you can see from that view on the left. It involved uh, a number of different railway companies who actually kept separate stations there, uh, rented from the originally rented from uh, the first line to get in there, the London and Greenwich Railway. Um, and the original areas underneath have recently been opened up, but um, don't really present. Uh, preserve any resemblance to that original station which came in on the viaduct at high level and was just uh, a couple of tracks no buildings at all there was nothing to cover the station uh, you simply had to go up some steps uh, having bought your ticket at a, an office to one side um, bought your ticket walked up to the station got the train to Greenwich there but there was no covering at all of the station uh, not even the magnificence of an entrance uh, as they'd done at Euston. So it never was uh, a particularly great station, even in the early days. And I think over the years, the station had just grown considerably. But because it was run by two separate railway companies um, and there was no love lost between them, it was really quite a difficult station to use unless you were a regular commuter and knew where you were going. Um, but it's all now been completely rebuilt. This is the most recent of the rebuilds of London stations. Um, and there's a view at night on the right hand side there, showing um, the tracks area, which is the upper part, first floor, uh, and a completely rebuilt uh, underground entrance. This is the interior of London Bridge, as completely rebuilt and opened uh, in 2018 and this has all the features that a, a railway station should have but which London Bridge never had uh, and that is new uh, passenger information boards which are very clear and new uh, logos and information about where the loos are, where there are lifts, everything else. It's really a very easy and quite a pleasant station to use and it even has seating uh, all over the place, unlike uh, Euston and uh, most of the other older stations. And this new design of seats, which uh, National Rail have recently adopted, even though, of course, at the moment, they're still socially distanced, as you can see in the one on the right. And every platform uh, is now accessible in more than one way. So... The platforms are all at high level, but they all have either uh, escalator or lift access, as well as um, steps to them. And down below, what used to be largely covered over areas um, in the what's actually ground level, but feels like the vaults of the station, there are now um, through pedestrian routes with shops which are both, the shops are located 
to the left and right of this expanded tunnel uh, underneath the station, which, although it's all underground, there's no natural light, um, is really quite a pleasant area to use. And I hope we'll remain that way. So now from London Bridge, we'll move across into the city again to see where uh, one of the routes from London Bridge actually uh, managed to get across um, the Thames eventually, after much wrangling, and into the city itself. Um, as I said, London Bridge had been uh, developed by two separate railway companies. One of them eventually became a through station and uh, also got permission to go over the, the river um, to Cannon Street. Here's the view down the Thames from London Bridge and the remains uh, of the original terminus at Cannon Street, which was built in the 1860s. The main structure of Cannon Street still remains in, in terms of the, the walls around the station, but the, uh, the roof has gone. It had originally an arched roof between these two towers, which um, had to be demolished in the 1950s because it had been badly damaged by um, bombing during the war. And But the, the structure below remained. And if we look at the next view, you can see uh, the view up and down uh, the western side of the station and the tracks are all at the higher level um, next to the those terminal towers. Um, and most of the underneath is now used for um, shops and offices. Right at the front, as you can see in the left-hand photograph, is uh, a new um, office building on the front of the station, uh, which replaced its... Uh, original station hotel which was demolished in the 1960s um, most of those railway hotels don't survive because they just couldn't um, couldn't survive with, with as many of them as there were and some of them had been damaged as well during the war and Cannon Street there's no sign of the original hotel at all but there's the view uh, of the new office block at the front, which is not a particularly dramatic piece of architecture, but it is rather dramatically lit at night. It has this bracing on the outside of the building, which again, um, when it's beginning to get dark as there, really does look quite dramatic. And then to get into the, either the underground station or the mainline station, you go below that new office. Here it is during the day, again from London Bridge, with some pools in the background. Um, and you can see here quite clearly the, the new infill building between the towers and over the platforms, which has been put in um, at Cannon Street. They've all, again, it's a, an example of an office development really literally impinging itself right on top of the mainline station. But in this case, I think quite effectively. So it, it creates a, a building which looks as though it's now having a, a ship being launched between the towers. Along to the next one, uh, which made its way into the city and through the city, actually, um, on the north side of the Thames. This is... Um, Blackfriars, which has been transformed from being a terminal building into a, a through station now, and more than that, uh, a station which runs right across the river. It's been extended from the, the north side, original north side terminus, which has been virtually demolished, uh, right across uh, the river. And at the south end uh, of the old um, bridge across the Thames there, uh, it's been preserved with the London, Chatham and Dover Railways original magnificent badge, cast iron decoration, which is a huge structure, um, best seen from, uh, from the road bridge nearby. And there it is. At the other end, the rebuilt uh, Blackfriars 
uh, through station uh, has got the uh, much simpler decorative features of both National Rail and London Underground on the new terminal building. So an interesting contrast in style there between Victorian pomposity and uh, modern simplicity, if you like. Here's the interior of Blackfriars as recently rebuilt with the platforms extending right across um, the Thames now and there are entrances both on the north and on the south close to Tate Modern. Um, this uh, is one of the principal stations for Thameslink which is the new north-south London railway. Um, well, I say it's new, it's always been there that line, but it's it's now been fully rebuilt such that there are stations on it which had not been used for many years. Um, and it also has a suitably magnificent view of, of London on the platforms here. You can see both um, east and west on the river up towards Tower Bridge and the other way. And it's got well, brand new trains as well. The view on the right is a, a reflection of the um, Unilever House, which is a 1930s construction on the north side. Um, and that's the, the view of Unilever House reflected in the, uh, the current station at Blackfriars. And there is the rather complicated setup, which you can see with the road bridge at Blackfriars on the right, uh, the, the, the current uh, rail station on the left, and there it is, um, built right out across the bridge. The platforms didn't extend this far originally, uh, but what they've used is not the original um, rail structure here, which was supported on these red columns. That was taken out in the 70s, and the new uh, or the current um, rail link and platforms there are actually partly built out and supported by these original um, piers of construction. So again it's a complicated history but it's actually been resolved rather well to create something which partly celebrates the, the past and is completely unused now but also provides a, a beautifully new railway station which um, has actually got solar panels forming its roof structure so that apparently all the electricity needed for running the station, although not the trains of course, um, is provided by the solar panels right along the roof. I think it's one of the longest uh, solar panels in, uh, in London. There's a view again looking south with the station below and with its solar panels. And on the left-hand side there is the new structure of, of Tate Modern, which is directly accessible uh, from the south end of the new station. And that, there uh, is the new north end station, which I showed the reflections of just a little while ago. Um, that's the main entrance to Blackfriars now. Inside the station there is actually a a series of, of cut stone uh, with the names of all the places that originally you could get to from this station, such as St. Petersburg and uh, others which, I mean, there haven't been boat trains from here for years and years. But John Betjeman did apparently at one stage in the 1970s ask for a ticket to St. Petersburg and he was just referred to a Victoria station to get the, the boat train in those days but at least the stones have been preserved. Now, next one down of those stations where lines have come across the river is Charing Cross. Again, this was a matter of railway company desperate to get access both to the West End and the city and wanting to bring its trains across the river and eventually getting permission. The station which you see today, which is on the right-hand side there, beyond Waterloo Bridge, is um, largely, at least at the river end, has been largely demolished and removed. But the other side of the station, as we'll see in a minute, has been 
uh, preserved as it was in the 1860s. So it's a strange station of two halves, Charing Cross, originally built in the 1860s and um, had a, a, a curved terminal roof uh, where the new roof is now in the middle there, uh, which looks, the, the new roof actually looks at its best at this time when it's just getting dark and uh, appears really quite dramatic. But it's it's not quite as happy inside. I think it's rather a low ceiling. It doesn't work so well. There it is inside. And as you can see, it, it really feels, I think, a bit claustrophobic. This is the inside of that massive new building designed by Terry Farrell, which kind of goes, wraps all round the uh, original station um, with offices above and below the building. But the station platforms get new, no daylight at all. The only section of the station which has daylight is uh, the concourse area, which we're looking away from here, um, which has also retained its original clock. So if we go now to the next slide, um, on the right-hand side there is, is the original station clock, which is still there, and outside is the Victorian reconstruction of the original Charing Cross, um, designed by Barry here. It's not known quite what the original looked like because it was actually demolished in the um, just in the post-Civil War period. But it's a rather magnificent Victorian idea of what a, a medieval cross was. The original was uh, constructed by Edward I as a memorial to his queen, Eleanor, when she died in the medieval period. And the construction of that cross is actually um, reproduced in the underground station below in a, a wonderful um, woodcut design by David Gentleman, which stretches the full length of the Northern Line platforms here. If we go outside the strand end of the station, this is still uh, preserves the original hotel part of the station built in the 1860s, although somewhat uh, cut back from its original design because it was badly damaged by bombing in the war. So um, the top two floors of the hotel are actually a rather uh, odd reconstruction, which doesn't look much like the original, which is rather magnificent French uh, style design. But you can see there the uh, the main uh, taxi area of the station on the Strand. On the left hand side there, that's the, the bridge on the uh, eastern side of the station, which goes across to an extension of the hotel um, built in the late Victorian period. It's still actually a very large hotel, which inside has some magnificent period rooms. Um, Betjeman call it the best Victorian dining room in London that's there. And much of the original hotel and these uh, on the left hand side of the right hand picture there, you can just see one of the uh, little um, box rooms which have created areas where you can have tea still. But if we look at the whole station, although it's in black and white there, you can see that the top areas of the station um, are rather bland reconstructions. The rest of the station is much more magnificent. This is the area where you you go in on the ground floor on the left hand side to get into the station. Up above it is the tea room um, where you can still have a lovely tea and uh, view the strand as you do. Right, now Waterloo. Waterloo is the busiest station in London now, has been for many years, um, and it's the only one of those Victorian termini which was virtually completely reconstructed in the early 20th century. It took them about 20 years to do it, but um, it created a, a magnificently large concourse at Waterloo, and Waterloo is still a very easy station to use. 
uh, and it's still got many of its original features like these lift towers you can see in the center of the left hand um, photograph there but in many ways it's a move beyond the old victorian stations because it's a steel grid um, station building um, which uh, none of the others are they're all cast iron uh, designs of bridges uh, of, of station roofs which have mostly now gone waterloo is not exactly attractive but it it works very well it's a very functionally designed station and it's got underground tunnels below these lifts which can move both passengers and luggage uh, very easily the last part is the section on the right uh, of these photographs that's the uh, victory arch uh, entrance to waterloo which was not completed until 1922 by which time it was adapted slightly to become a war memorial for um, the london southwestern railway and inside it there are the the lists of the casualties of the lswr on that um, during the first world war it's a slightly over the top design uh, in many ways but it's it's still quite a magnificent design unfortunately it's still bounded by on the right hand side there by a, a rather grim 1960s office block which was put up there um, in the 1960s and that's where um, there originally were offices of the station which were quite badly damaged during the last war but I think that particular building which looks very odd right up against this Edwardian style uh, decorative entrance that will go soon uh, just be demolished and reconstructed inside another survivor of the old London Southwestern Railway which became part of the Southern in 1922 just when the station was completed um, you can now go upstairs and see at, at first hand the old London Southwestern Railway badge on the glass of the windows above the original taxi entrance to uh, the station which is rather magnificent and you couldn't see it at all until they built a, a new circulating area above the main concourse you can now go right up to that uh, but you could hardly see it at all without binoculars before there's a, a dramatic view of the platforms at Victoria at Waterloo as they are now and beyond there um, in the distance you can see the very different uh, design of the Eurostar terminal which was built here in the 1990s um, the main station building at Waterloo is, is quite rectangular but uh, in the 1990s when they were first looking for a, a terminus for Eurostar trains from the continent um, they designed a new building which snakes around the edge of Waterloo which is designed with a, a curved roof rather like the old Victorian stations um, but it's much longer than any of the existing Victorian stations because the Eurostar trains were so long now this had a, a rather checkered history it was opened very quickly and to a brilliant design by Grimshaw um, but it didn't last very long simply because uh, they decided to uh, reroute uh, High Speed 1 the line from um, from Kent to bring Eurostar trains into London which could only be done to Waterloo on the existing main lines and therefore could not be a high speed service uh, they built a new line from Kent under the river across Essex under East and North London and finally into London St Pancras which became St Pancras International and opened in 2007 this meant that um, Waterloo Eurostar terminal uh, only lasted from 1994 until 2007 and then became completely redundant here you can see that the building as it is now after many years of lying empty um, the station has now been reconstructed so it can be used as part of the mainline station 
at Waterloo. Uh, and that magnificent roof is can be seen again. Uh, and it's now fully reopened and in use. But the whole uh, process of developing Waterloo from the 90s to the uh, to 2014 or so was really a, a, a ridiculous waste of money because the right decisions were not taken at the right time as to how to reuse it. But there it is, uh, as it is now and can be used, um, looking superb. And just on the main concourse, you can still uh, see the original station clock. Most of the old station clocks have been lost at the station. Some of them were disappeared, were exported to American restaurants, like the one at Victoria. But Waterloo has still got its uh, early 20th century station clock, which has now been adjusted uh, to be a 24-hour clock as well. And apparently it automatically adjusts to British summertime and back. Uh, and it no longer has um, station trolleys and uh, parcels vans and things running below it. None of that goes through the main concourse now. So you can actually stand and meet someone under the clock without fear of being run over. Waterloo actually has briefly, I think briefly, lost its position as being the busiest London station to Stratford, which we haven't covered in this book because it's not a terminal station, but Stratford temporarily during the pandemic has become the busiest station. I think that will return to Waterloo uh, once we get back to something like normal. Right, and finally, the stations, uh, Victoria, uh, last of the stations, and this again has a curious story to it because again it was developed by two separate uh, railway companies uh, in the 19th century who never worked together so the two stations were completely divided and even today although Victoria is allegedly one station um, it feels like two stations because there's a wall between the two structures but you can see if you stand back and again Ben was able to get a shot without traffic, which is pretty unusual here, of Victoria with um, the two stations. There's the uh, London Chatham and Dover on the left there and the London Brighton South Coast on the right. And you'll see that the, uh, the Chatham station has been brought forward slightly uh, so that it contrasts with the other station and there was no passage between them originally. This was all... Um, rebuilt. The current structures were uh, rebuilt with these new facades in the early 1900s. The one station, the uh, the Chatham station on the left, actually has um, magnificent caryatids, um, female caryatids actually, on the upper areas of the station, which I'll show you in just a moment. The Brighton uh, block to the right-hand side um, the railway actually extended at right angles the original Grosvenor Hotel, which you see in the far right, which is the surviving bit of this side of the original station from the 1860s, not actually built by the railway company. Again, the, the hotel was built by a separate company uh, and still has a magnificent uh, Victorian interior to it, still open as a hotel. Um, but the frontage here uh, was and of the Chatham station as well, was originally a rather um, jumbled mix without a proper building in the front of it, right up to the 1900s. The uh, Brighton Company decided to rebuild uh, a proper frontage to the station as part of the hotel and created a new entrance to the station below. Outside it is the, the bus yard, which has also been recently redeveloped and after years of chaos, has has really become um, a rather attractive bit of, of the station, along with the new underground entrance there, this glass box on the left-hand side. That's just to show you the caryatids of the uh, Chatham station on the left, which are appropriately um, maritime because this is where the boat trains used to go from. So unusually, you see there are female caryatids there, uh, both left and right. And 
the Chatham side of the station also still retains its original roof on the left-hand side there, um, which actually was designed by John Fowler, who was the engineer at the same time of the Metropolitan and District Railways, the under, early underground. One of the other survivors uh, on the other side of the station, the Brighton side, which has recently been revealed. It used to be hidden behind phone boxes, which of course we don't use anymore, uh, is the London Brighton South Coast Railways um, suburban lines uh, as shown on a, um, on a tiled map, which dates from about 1908, when they introduced the first electric suburban services at Victoria. And then from the outside of the station, there's the, on the left there, the Grosvenor Hotel, uh, which still looks pretty superb uh, and has recently been cleaned up. And the interior is, again, largely restored. Unlike so many hotels in London, it still has an original grand staircase, which you get to straight away, rather than being shuffled to lifts inside. But Victoria, like all the stations in London, is increasingly encroached upon by uh, huge new uh, skyscrapers and other office blocks on the outside. So there's the Chatham roof designed by Fowler with the latest um, office block addition behind. And finally, to depart from Victoria, um, just to show you yet another development in London that's going on now, which is accessible by underground, if not by overground trains, and that's as you go out of Victoria, you pass by Battersea Power Station, which is seen here about three years ago when it was still being reconstructed. It, the work is still going on, but uh, that's going to become one of London's latest developments, Battersea Power Station. Um, the line goes up uh, the gradient from Victoria Station, which is behind the cameraman here, and crosses the river. Uh, Grosvenor Bridge and passes the uh, superb towers of, of Gilbert Scott's power station. And then as the final view, just to remind you, if you want to read more about this, you will have to look at the book. Um, this is the cover of the book that uh, we have produced, uh, which has a, a lovely foreword from Sir Peter Hendy, chairman of Network Rail. Um, and that view that I referred to at the beginning um, of Paddington from Platform One, which we photographed two years ago at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, that is that is it. Um, but you can read a lot more if you do acquire a copy of the book, which of course I'd recommend. And I'd like to thank Benjamin for all the work he did on the photography for this. Um, and we hope you'll enjoy going round the stations of magnificent stations of London again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver. That was a great presentation and a great advertisement for the book, which I heartily recommend. Benjamin's photos are just stunning. Although the lockdowns gave many of us grief and personal inconvenience, they were obviously a gift for the photographer by allowing clear shots with little traffic and very few people about. Benjamin has very kindly offered to give the friends a separate presentation on his transport photography and will be taking up this offer later in the year. If you're not already a member of the friends, please do consider joining us. The website details where you can get more information uh, are on the screen below. Taking out friends membership is a great way of supporting the museum and of tapping into some valuable membership benefits too. Thanks again to Oliver for taking time to repeat his presentation in this recording. We hope now to continue our meetings programme as live events for members of the Friends, but also still to record those meetings that we can for our wider YouTube audience. Thank you all for watching.